and welcome to Series 4 of Kvikminderpod, an Icelandic cinema podcast. I'm Rob Watts, and as ever, I'm joined by my good friend Ellie Cawthorn for another journey through the Icelandic cinematic landscape. It's incredibly exciting to be back, getting stuck into another handful of films from the country of Iceland. And thanks for coming along for the ride. As with previous series, we chat about films from the last two decades of Icelandic cinema to uncover unlikely stories and characters unique to the land of ice and fire. Before we begin episode one, just a quick reminder that we're on social media and you should definitely follow us. On Twitter and Instagram, we're at kvikmindapod, that's K-V-I-K-M-Y-N-D-A-P-O-D, and subscribe or follow us wherever you get your podcasts. We'd appreciate a rating and or review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts if you listen there. And if you're feeling extra generous, we have a Ko-fi page where you can support us if you like what you hear. All our links can be found on Insta, Twitter and in the show notes. We're kicking off Series 4 with some more Baltasar Kormakur. Surprised? Well, you shouldn't be, because he's a huge name and he's directed a shit ton of films since the year 2000. Including 2012's The Deep, or Dupith starring Olafur Dari Olafsson. We've not seen a lot of Icelandic history shown on film across the movies we've covered so far, but The Deep is a true story set in the 1970s. How much is it a disaster movie, and how much is it really telling us? Find out as we go... Into the Deep. Hi Ellie. Hi Rob. How's it going? Good, thank you. Yeah. I'm um, back in action after recent foot drama. <laughs> foot drama? That, oh, hence why we're recording in a different place today. Yes, and my annoying ticking clock is in the background for everyone. I'm sure everybody's listening out for that now. Oh, yeah, but hopefully my flat sounds as nice as yours usually does. I'm sure it does. It's got a lot more books than my one, I must say. Oh yeah, I mean noise cancelling books. I reckon yeah, so. Deadening. Yeah, deadening. You know they used uh, Mills and Boom books to pad out the M4 motorway, like the under what? under the surface of the M4 toll. They used pulped Mills and Boom books as like the layer below the tarmac. So they've probably got some kind of good. That doesn't properties. sound very safe. Too much spice and hotness <laughs> under there. No, that's the last. The cracks will show. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yes. We're here in your flat, and it's good. We're here for the start of series four. Woo! I know. But we're here going to talk about a film, as always. Uh, And this week, it's The Deep from 2012. The Deep. Also known as Dupith, uh, which means The Deep, I believe. And this is directed by Baltasar Kormakur. Our old mate. Our old buddy. Is this our third or fourth Ooh, I think um, it's third, right? Third, I think. He did Jar City, 101 Reykjavik. And this. And that's it. But he did pop up in... Reykjavik, Rotterdam. That's the one. Yes. And I chose this today because obviously Kormako is a big old name in Iceland. But he's currently got a film at the cinema at time of recording. The, uh, the Idris Elba punches a lion <gasps> beast. Do you know what? I am desperate to see this. Same. It sounds mad. I love a kind of cheesy, silly action thriller. Yeah. I'm just assuming it's cheesy. That might be unfair. I'm I'm assuming it's silly too. He hasn't really done cheese, but his action films are very kind of classic. Mm. But this is one man versus a a lion, I think. (laughs) think. Um, So it can't be anything but, surely. Uh, Which is very exciting. And it's at the cinema, which is, again, rare. But also... On Netflix, series three of Trapped has just dropped. Your fave. My fave. It's now called Entrapped. I mean, basically, the first series was called Trapped because everyone was trapped in one part of the island. After that story, Mm. the word trapped didn't quite mean the same. Yeah. So this is Entrapped. Six episodes on Netflix. I have seen it all. And it's good. I feel like it could have been better. Mm. Uh, it got shut down from eight episodes to six from the Icelandic version. Really? And I think you can tell, and I'm not sure why they've done that. 
Mm, Because usually I'd be all that, all for chopping things down. Mm -hmm. I think things are usually too baggy, but that's interesting. It felt like a lot of plot points were just not developed, um, and characters appear. So, for example, Iris Tanya, who appeared in Catler, Mm -hmm. she is in it for approximately two minutes across the series, arrives and then disappears, and you sort of think. What? She was in those two episodes that got cut. <laughs> Potentially, <laughs> in the air. But yes, that's about Sarkomako production. And it stars Olafur Dari Olafsson, mm. the man himself, centre of the deep. So I thought, you know, while all that's going on, let's uh, let's Talk take a look it. at this one from 2012. So if it's the 10-year anniversary, if we want to <laughs> use that as another reason. But yeah, good one, right? Yeah, really enjoyed this, actually. I- A kind of simple narrative, well told, Mm -hmm. interesting characters. Yeah. Well, shall I? I'll do a little synopsis. It'll only take two seconds. It's basically the story of a fishing vessel, trawler boat, that capsizes in the North Atlantic, causing all the crew to die, except for one Mm. remarkable chap called Gully. And really importantly, it's inspired by true events. I think, like, if Mm -hmm. you don't know that going in, you'd be like, this is a strange film and weird approach but when you know it's a true story it becomes much more remarkable right for sure yeah when you feel, when you realize where it's going because you know for the first sort of hour hmm. it feels like a sort of classic survival film yeah albeit a little bit kind of more muted and it's not like full-on action adventure it's not the yeah. perfect storm or castaway or something but it is very much a survival film that becomes something else in the second half or the third third. Yeah. I, it's, yeah, it's uh, it's really interesting. So this is a story set in 1984 mm-hmm. uh, when the the crew of a, of a yeah fishing vessel capsized and they all lost their lives. And then, so Olaf or Dari Olafsson plays this real character called Gully and he basically survives. Yeah. Uh, and no one can quite understand why. Yeah, I thought... It was confusing watching this film, knowing, as you always do now when you stream something, how long it was. Mm. Because, so, as you say, the first third of the film were kind of introduced to all the characters. We're joining them on the boat. It's quite fun. There's uh, banter and it's quite informal and casual. The second third, gruelling um, survival attempt, basically. For sure. So, which I'm sure we'll talk about these in more depth. Depth. And then the third, so I assumed, you know, he's he kind of makes it through this survival. And I thought, what is going on here? Because we still have 40 minutes left yeah. of this film. How is this? Usually it would be the big climactic end that he's, I'm thinking of, you know, like 127 hours or something mm-hmm. like that. Makes it out at the end. Woohoo. End of film. But yeah, still 40 minutes on the clock, which then it takes a kind of different turn. For me, I was a bit thrown by that kind of narrative Mm. structure or, well, I was going to say narrative arc, but it very much peaked early. (laughs) Yeah, 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 I agree. I don't know. How did you feel about that? Yeah, I I felt exactly the same. Um, It's 75, no, it's not 75, it's 95 minutes long. Mm -hmm. At one point, I thought it was 75 minutes long and we were like an hour in. I was like, okay, it's quite short and they've really done it and then suddenly it was like no actually you've got another 40 minutes and I was like I don't know what's going to happen and even in that 40 minutes it was a bit like probably doesn't need to be 40 yeah, minutes I think that last section could maybe have been achieved in 15 to 20 minutes mm-hmm. but what I did like is that it didn't feel like a Hollywood survival movie yeah in that respect it was like trying to be something a bit more sort of I don't know personal True to life, probably, Mm -hmm. as well. Because I guess in most Hollywood, as we said, most Hollywood survival things, it's a a moment of triumph and glory and there'd be some sentimental music at the end. Whereas Mm -hmm. this, he survives, he comes back, and it's a bit anticlimactic. Yeah. Like, really anticlimactic. Like, his mates are dead. He's got quite a dry life. Am I skipping ahead too much here? Maybe. We'll we'll get to that. (laughs) Um, But you're right about the whole Hollywood thing. Because... It's a true story. And, you know, Hollywood has a tendency to completely over-egg the action and the drama and the music and the, all of that. And we really don't have that here. And I think Cormac chose to do that as a deliberate choice 
to kind of because it's so close to home and because it wasn't that long ago really mm. i mean we're getting on to to 40 years now but um it's still pretty close to people's hearts in the country yeah. and i don't think he wanted to upset people too much by changing the narrative i guess also why this is interesting as a survival film is that it's an extraordinary story but about very ordinary people mm -hmm. and they're like from when we're introduced to them they're not made out to be some dashing hero uh our main guy or any of the others to be honest they're just pretty bog it's, standard mediocre dudes yeah, just fishermen yeah classic fishermen Those people, We're in the south of Iceland for this film, in the Westman Islands. So that's mm -hmm. like a group of tiny islands just south of the south part of the island. Uh, Vestmana, I can't, I can never say it. Vestmana Eyjar, but probably said much faster <laughs> than that. Um, and they live on an island called Heime. And basically we just see a bunch of people sort of getting pissed the night before knowing they've got to go out on the boat and do their kind of main job. And that scene, the scene of getting pissed the night before was very 101 Reykjavik to me. Wasn't it just? Yeah, very kind of seedy bar, people snogging in the corner, people throwing up because they're really drunk. Mm -hmm. Just the kind of dive bar vibes. Yeah, I feel I felt like it was that kind of quiet town small town hedonistic friday mm. i don't know i mean i don't i can't remember what day it was but i assume it was near the weekend but yeah it felt very much like this is uh this is the evening where everyone goes mm. large the one night a week yeah uh and it certainly it showed us all our characters in in the space of like five minutes didn't it mm. so we meet gully played by olaf for daria olafson who's he's sort of yeah getting pissed we notice that like he's got his eye on a girl, but mm. he's a bit shy, he's a bit schlubby. Schlubby was the exact word <laughs> I was going to use to describe him. Sl schlubby, schlubby, mm. is it? It is. And then, so he makes friends with, or he, he meets this guy who says he's going to be the cook on the boat. Um, there's another couple, he's got a couple of friends, Hannes mm. and Laurus, who are both, you know, I think they're father, son, just having a drink as well. They all seem to know each other. They're all going to go out in the morning. Um, and that doesn't seem to stop them getting very, very drunk, very yeah. near to the time they need to wake up. Yeah. I feel like the thought of being on a fisherman's boat on a hangover is probably about the worst location you could have for a hangover. Yeah. Like I... seasickness, dead fish smell, like people smoking inside. Ugh. No. Even for people like that, who this is their daily job, mm. this they're used to all of these things, it can't be, it can't, yeah, it's not a nice experience, surely. Again, though, I quite liked this opening sequence that they weren't portrayed as, you know, wholesome, you know, go getting enterprising <laughs> fishermen. They were just shown to be kind of like a loserish layabouts. Um, didn't really care about their work, like felt much more authentic than a lot of these patrols would be. Yeah, I don't know if they don't care about their work, but they certainly know that they can just get up in any state and mm. go and do it. This is their life. I guess the only thing sort of positive character trait we see is when Gully intervenes in the fight oh, to yeah. save the cook. Mm. I think that's supposed to sort of show us that he's... yeah a good guy yeah but i uh, you know he's still, and that there's still a fighting. kind of crew loyalty in the crew i guess yeah that every man is a member of a team and they all mm. stick together that's a good point uh the, the biggest drunk of the lot we've seen before <laughs> thrust the leo yes. who played noe's alcoholic father pretty good drunk isn't he yeah it's a go-to role <laughs> <laughs> comes naturally He's got form as well for playing dodgy crew members in Reykjavik, Rotterdam. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> you yeah. have hidden stashes of booze. Oh, well, 
Nej, det är bara fyndigt till att göra med Okej. Har du sett att helvete är gång så är som ger? Laris' son, Hannes, who we see, they have this dog, this kind of Ugh. psycho little... <laughs> Why is it that? What is it about that dog? It's so weird. It's like the know. ugliest His dog. His eyes are so wide. <laughs> its tongue his... is like... Oh, yeah. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Gross. But yeah, they live They live together. They're father-son. They, um, you know, they obviously spend like all their waking hours together. But I guess mm. they develop this kind of bond that, you know, should see people through... On board a boat for days on end. Uh, yeah, that's his Hannes, played by Bjorn Tours, who we've seen a couple of times. And then we've also got Pauli mm. and Yon. And there might be one other person whose name I've forgotten, <laughs> which is bad. But uh, Pauli... He's the distinct one there, I think, isn't he? Because yeah. he's the family man. Exactly. So we've got, we've got a father and son. We've got Gully, who's kind of our main good guy character. And then we've got Pauli with his wife and kids mm. his wife played by thora bjorg helga who we've also seen yeah uh she did metalhead the year after this um and they kind of bring that sort of yeah like you say family they kind of center the story a little mm. bit more remind us that there are people on the land waiting for these guys to come back yeah and they never do so should we go into what happens to these guys on their boat yeah go on them because it well, doesn't look like much really like no the they must be so used to fishing in these areas because they don't get that far mm. that far from the island do they i don't know whether i misread it because i don't know anything about boats and shipping but it felt like the film didn't necessarily didn't really try to blame anybody it wasn't like this guy was drunk and didn't do this thing it no. was it felt quite just unavoidable situation yeah because uh, for a couple of moments i was thinking oh mm. Laurus is drunk it's going to be yeah, his fault so. but actually we just see him like he's hung over and whatever and being sick but he's mm. doing his job he knows what he's yeah. doing it's no one's fault that they've got caught snagged on a rock because we like see it happen you say, the first time that must happen like if you're a fishing trawler out in the sea mm-hmm. that must happen all the time yeah and they should they obviously know the lay of the See? <laughs> <laughs> I could see you where you were going with that and I was like, how are you going to get out of this <laughs> phrase? <laughs> the lay of the sea. Very so, yeah, good. quite a new phrase. Um, so it must be something that they would expect to encounter and they yeah. can obviously deal with it because we see it happen once. They snag the net on a rock, on, on a rock and I have to say though, you it. know, like if I was going to be in a maritime disaster... On a hangover would not be when I wanted that to happen. No. Your reactions would be slow. You'd be like physically weak. So are you saying that actually if they weren't hungover, they could have saved themselves? No, I feel like that's maybe a bit unfair. (laughs) But but I don't know, maybe there's part of it. Well, there's a point, isn't there, where the captain says, oh, they're brand new fishing nets nets or ropes or whatever. So I don't, I'll try and untangle them. Yeah, rather than just cutting them loose. Yeah, so yeah. I guess maybe that was part of the issue, but I guess it doesn't really matter. Well, the why. film's certainly not trying to point blame no. at anybody, is it? Yeah. No. I mean, it would be a bit awkward if it was, since these were all real people who yeah, and the only, died. Yeah, and the only first-hand report we've got is Gully, and yeah. he's not pointing the finger at anybody, as no. far as we know. So yeah, they snag on a rock, uh, just sort of, I think, it's six kilometres south of the island i think and very very quickly yeah the boat lists scary how quickly things can go wrong at sea yeah after watching titanic as a child i've always had a concern <laughs> about this yeah and that's a completely different scale as well but um, yeah, still not into cruises not into any of that no not small not boats open only water. well this was a small boat but just pedalos <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of scary how quickly it goes wrong, isn't it? Yeah, and this film really does show how fast it happens because one second they're caught on the rock, the next second you sort of see the boat tip. Laurus bangs his head. Someone else falls over. The water, in an amazing shot, 
where the water mm. kind of comes across the screen as the boat's tipping. Basically, that's, that's it. That's it. Bye. <laughs> Game over. Yeah. Scary and stuff. It must just be freezing. All I could oh. think, this film, it's set in Iceland. A lot of the films look cold, but fucking hell. So like, cold. So cold. One thing, I only really work in degrees Celsius. So it did flash up with the degrees, oh, yeah, didn't it, in it did. Fahrenheit? And I was like, no. And idea. also, the numbers are up to like 95 <laughs> no, uh, yeah. Fahrenheit. Like, that doesn't sound very cold. <laughs> no, no idea what that is. But presumably, it's cold. <laughs> yeah, very cold. And, you know, you can imagine to a degree capsizing in a boat in the Mediterranean and being like, okay, yeah. so you need to deal with getting out of this boat, but yeah. not. The second, trying to think yeah the second you're in that water you're already fighting for your life trying mm. to breathe trying to stop your body shutting down oh, God. it's it's pretty bad i feel like i am quite all right with horror films yeah. not as all right with as you but you <laughs> know i'm not so into gore but i'm fine with horror films the things that really get me are like real life disaster slash survival things mm-hmm. um films such as contagion or <gasps> you know quite often global disaster films but this falls quite close to that camp of like this could actually happen and For sure. would be terrifying yep so i know uh, and, and yeah like you said it happens so quickly the boat tips over someone's knocked unconscious they're essentially done mm. unconscious under the water in that it's cold quite a, probably the best way to die actually then knocked out before any, like, you don't have to drown. No, I mean, do we see anyone actually drown? Most people seem to just fall Free. asleep or, yeah. I guess maybe, maybe yeah, you would basically freeze to death before you drown. Uh, except for Gully. He manages to save someone mm. by punching through the window, which is great, but ultimately... Some crazy feats of human endurance happening. Yeah. Um, and Hannes tries to go back for his dad... It's the, what the film does really interestingly is it doesn't go, right, we're just going to follow this person, do their thing. We're going to follow this person, do their thing. Someone will say, I'm going over there and we'll just never and see just them again. I guess that's partly because we actually don't like, like that y- Yoan is like, I'm mm-hmm. just going to set off now. And then it's like, bye. I guess we don't know what happened to Yoan. Like his body probably was never found. I mean, presumably he just froze and, and drowned. Yeah. But... Like you say, I guess part of it is probably because we we don't know. But obviously, Balthazar Comico could have invented a story there, but he chose not to and chose to remain focused on Gully. Yeah, I th- and I think that's the right choice as well. We get these lovely, I say lovely, probably not the right adjective, but we get these sort of eerily beautiful shots of the the bodies floating yeah in the water i'm sure that gully didn't see them looking quite as uh artfully uh, positioned yeah but... well it's quite a challenge though isn't it for a filmmaker this section of the story because it happened at night mm-hmm. it's basically pitch black yeah and i mean you had to watch this in a room without any kind of too much light coming in oh yeah screen otherwise glare. you can't see anything I literally can't see anything but i feel like that's done quite well um this sense of there's also a great shot which i really liked where you see gully kind of on his own in the ocean and, and you're fairly tight on him mm. but from above and then it like zooms just out keeps going and you realize how he is just this tiny speck in this like vast black Inky velvety black sea. sea and mm-hmm. it's really chilling it's really chilling and you know he's a big man mm. and this film makes him look absolutely tiny like you watch him walk into a room entrapped and it's like this big bear mm. of a man like he commands the room and in this he's like yes he's surviving but he looks like a yeah, yeah. just a, a tiny little dot 
Yeah. Um, that is a great shot, actually. Mm. And that was one of the things I wanted to talk about, actually. It's like, we've spoken about how Iceland doesn't really have stuntmen and things like that. <laughs> but this film, he's clearly doing all of the stunts or the, the mm. stuff in the water. And it must have been an endurance just for him. Well, presumably they didn't film it when it was as freezing cold, hopefully. Perhaps Although not. Although I can't not imagine the Iceland winter. sea ever gets very warm. No, the North Atlantic is not a not a warm sea. But yeah, being in that at any point for any length of time wouldn't be comfortable. Wouldn't be pleasant. Um, and we see so much happen. I suppose we'll get to it in a second. After Gully has uh, kind of spoken to seagulls and, mm. and all of this, but he ends up dashed against the rocks and... Oh just completely battered by waves constantly and he did that One of my notes is how the fuck did they film this? Because they didn't have a water tank. They Are you just, sure? Yeah. There's a, there's a three minute making of documentary on YouTube. And you just, you see a little bit of the directors standing on the rocks <laughs> with a cameraman. Isn't that off you go? Gary's like in the, yeah, in the shore. And that's basically it. And he's just getting absolutely battered by waves and every time he slipped over and looked like he was like, that must have been a genuine oh. injury yeah uh so i mean fair play to everyone involved there like mm. for the sake of making it feel authentic so the so the kind of out at sea sections where he's floating in the sea as you say speaking to seagulls and stuff mm. was that filmed from a boat and he was in the water next so, to the yeah. boat Oh, wow. I mean, maybe there were some scenes where they did using a water tank, but from what I can tell, pretty much like just did it where it was, where it happened, yeah. which is kind Crazy. of insane, really. Yeah. Um, so we, we lose all of the crew um, one by one. Mm. But we see, I think there's three left, sort of yeah. clutching at the wreck of the ship. Again, anything like that just now is always Titanic in my mind. Yeah, yeah. You know, the d floating on the door and Jack then floating off there's not room the here for you jack yeah exactly it's inevitable that that's just what it's called back yep it's an iconic scene in the most highest grossing film of all time <laughs> like, yeah and i mean it's essentially the same thing they have no choice but to attempt to make their way to safety I'm... one of them even says it's every man for himself now brutal yeah oh, just that's like quite harsh yeah, I mean, I know I'd be that one that's just like, I'm really cold. I'm just going to give up and let the waters take me. I, d I always think in these survival it's things. It's quite negative of you, Ellie. <laughs> well, I know, but it's true. <laughs> because I'm like, I could just let myself die now. Or I could like have this horrible fight for survival and then probably die at the end anyway. So I may as well just die. Now. Getting a good glimpse of your honestly, I always, outlook. I always think this. You know, like in these like global apocalypse things, I'm like, oh yeah, do I want to live on in the post-apocalyptic world and like fight zombies or whatever? No, I'll just let me just die. Let me just die straight away. I'm sort of with you on the whole zombie apocalypse thing, but yeah. Oh, maybe in this, I'd probably try a bit more because I'd be like, at least, and kind of close to the. Sure, but I'm, I'm very pathetic. I'd, I don't think I'd last long. <laughs> well, I think there's really no choice for the characters here. So 
Yun, I think it's Yun. It is, yeah. He swims off and we never see him again. But that's his choice. And I mean, we can imagine he's just succumbed to the cold. cold. And then Gully's looking after Pali, who is not handling it well. He can't, he's basically like gone. He's got mm. hypothermia. He can't move. Um, he's struggling to stay awake and Gully's mm. trying hard. But like Pali's got no control over what happens to him. He's basically like on the way out and he falls asleep and he dies. And Gully isn't dying. I don't know. Yeah. He's not necessarily trying not that, trying that hard not to die. He just isn't dying. Yeah. I, th- I mean, one thing that I kept kind of saying when I was watching this was like, he doesn't seem like he's struggling that much. Maybe no. in the rocks and stuff, but maybe that's how it genuinely was for him. I wondered it. Well, I, I wanted to just see him suffer a bit more. It did feel a bit like that, actually. Yeah, it's like he's just sort of coasting through this. Yeah, like, I get it's it's still a survival film. For most of it, he seems pretty. He's fine. Like he's treading water. Yeah, <laughs> which is, I guess, kind of the point of this film, right? Exactly. We'll come back to that whole true to life authentic thing but we do so there's the point so we talked about the seagull briefly a second ago and he he's all on his own he's trying to figure out what to do so he starts talking to the one lone gull Uh, and i I thought for a second that he was like he was succumbing to hypothermia Mm. like he's he's getting delusional he's losing it yeah but it seems like it was more of a choice that he made to keep his mind... An emotional comfort. Mm. And he, it's the seagull that brings him back almost as well. Because he uh, at one point does sort of sink, drown. Um, and it's his memories and his and the seagull that bring him back to the surface and push him onwards. And perhaps now's a good time to talk about the flashbacks. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Which were interesting. Uh, and unexpected and at the start, the first time we see them, I was a bit like, why are we watching his dreams in 35 minutes? <laughs> yeah. Like, that's an interesting choice. But it, I guess it, it kind of makes sense when you know what's what's what. Yeah. And it I guess it definitely sets it apart from the main action. Mm. And also, I guess a lot of people, it gives it that home movie quality, doesn't it? Of like nostalgic memories. Mm -hmm. And so this is set in what, 84. So he's remembering things that happened in... 73. Okay, Mm -hmm. very good. Some decent research. 73. And and I guess that format is quite a nostalgic format for that time. Yeah. I mean, it looks, yeah, home video-y, doesn't it? Mm. And it it sets it apart from the rest of the film in Mm. a way. And also it gives it a slight... um, a lot of his his memories have a kind of quality that is not it's they're not real life all of them mm-hmm. or or he has these kind of visions about oh god if you let me live one more day yeah. i'll make it the best day ever but obviously that's not a realistic vision of what this best day ever would be like it's no, it... an idealized portrait You're a lucky day. Lucky day. Come on. Come on. I was giving me Pareta in the boat. Pareta. Pareta, I got a sea bed. I'm the fucking stem what do you think the the flashbacks are kind of are they feeding into our main story here particularly well i was i was a bit intrigued obviously the focus of the flashbacks and then also it's referenced throughout isn't it is this eruption mm this volcanic eruption, which I presume is a real event that happened. Yeah, so in 1973, January 1973, Eldfell, which came to be named, volcano that hadn't erupted in 5,000 years, erupted out of nowhere. No one expected it to happen. Erupted on Haymei. 
Uh, they basically evacuated the entire island. That's like 5,000 people. And it's obviously a hugely historic and memorable moment. And it could have just completely destroyed everyone's livelihoods, the island, the fishermen. Because Heime is actually, I don't know if it still is, but was the centre of the fishing industry in Iceland. It was like the biggest money earner mm. for the for fishermen in the in Iceland at the time. And the lava flow from the ice from the volcano was headed towards the harbour. And if it had taken out the harbour, that would have been that. Yeah. All those people would have lost their livelihoods. The fishing industry would have gone under. But really interestingly, and this hasn't got much to do with the film, but <laughs> I thought it was really interesting that they managed to set up this thing of where they pumped all the pumped seawater onto the lava flow mm. to redirect it. Oh wow. And it, they managed to successfully cool. after like days, weeks of just pumping and pumping water at a certain part of the lava flow, stop it going anywhere near the harbour. And basically the harbour was fine. In fact I think it helped sort of create another bit of land. Um yeah, and in, you know, as as volcanoes do, it created loads more land on the island. They used the um, whatever you call the crap once it's kind of settled. Mm. They used that for landfill to build more houses on top of. They like ultimately they made the most of it. Yeah, and because the volcano had knocked out electricity to the island, uh, or the tremors and things prior to the volcano knocked out the electricity. They managed to use geothermal heat from the lava that was cooling over the next year to basically power the town until the electricity God, could be back. Resourceful, Isn't it? These it was Icelanders. Just, I, I was reading this all of this stuff, and like I urge anyone who thinks they might be interested in knowing about it, just to read even the Wikipedia page of this eruption in seventy three, because I was just like, it's absolutely astounding what they, how quickly they got everyone off the island yeah. for a start, and then what they did once they got back on the island and used the volcano for all these positive things. So, to play devil's advocate, yeah, that is a really interesting story. Like, so genuinely mm. fascinating. But I wonder if Balthazar Kormakor thought, isn't it crazy that this happened like 11 years after this volcano and the people involved experienced this volcano? That's crazy, so we should include that in this film. But I'm not sure how hugely relevant it was. It felt like quite a big thing in the flashbacks and continually mm -hmm. referenced. And I guess the point is that he had to climb over those lava fields, didn't he? Yeah. When he got on land. But to me, I was like, I'm not sure what the resonance or the significance of this eruption is to this story that's exactly what i thought you might say and it's exactly what i felt it's like obviously this was a big moment in mm. his and the islander's life but specifically with this story yeah and what what's it really saying mm. that they're a hardy bunch of people the brink of disaster you make it through i don't know well, maybe i mean that's an interesting thing to say because Kormako himself had described it said wanting to do this film as a metaphor, because in 2008, when Komako was thinking about doing this film, was the height of the banking collapse, the financial crisis in Iceland. Um, and interestingly, he described um, his reasoning for doing this film. He basically said, we speak of our nation as a ship. And when the economy took a dive, that was our nation's shipwreck. And he basically wanted to use this film as a way of showing the sort of strength of Iceland as overcoming adversity and making their way through, you know, hard times, um, which obviously Gully does mm -hmm. in the specific personal story. And maybe... Lots of other people had to die for that to happen. They did die. I don't know if they had to die for that <laughs> yeah. to happen. Um, but also the volcano eruption is a slightly, is like the next kind of level of, rather than the whole country, we've got a whole island making it through adversity. Um, so it's just another kind of layer of his kind of yeah. survival and story. As a filmmaker, volcanoes are very dramatic, aren't they? They're very they cinematic. Ah, and I was a bit surprised at the footage we do see because, like, that looks like real I footage think of the volcano. There was some real footage in there. But you? then also, Theodor Juliusson plays Gully's dad, and I was like, yeah. 
but he's in this footage as well. I think they've spl- I think there's a bit of splicing happening there. Well, they've done it incredibly well because mm. it looked not it looked seamless. Mm. I thought. Yeah. And it looked like it was a proper terrifying explosion. Terrifying. This is a sidetrack, but last week I saw Fire of Love about some volcanologists. Volcanologists? Yeah, yeah. Um, who were a married couple in the 70s and 80s and 90s. And if you want cinematic use of volcanoes, yeah. that <gasps> is the film for you. It's amazing. Ah, okay. It's so good. Where did you watch this? Strong recommend. Saw it at the Cube. Oh, shout out to the Cube in Woo! Bristol. Cube Microplex. Nice. Yeah, I've heard good things about Best that. film I've seen in ages. So the flashbacks add a dramatic weight to a point. And then, yeah, like we said, the flash forwards... Gully decides that he wants to live his life and sort the things out that he hasn't done. Like he owes money to someone. He wants to tell the girl that he loves that he loves her. He wants to look after the dog. Uh, <laughs> various other bits and pieces that he wants to make sure. He wants to ride a motorbike smiling in the sun. Oh, that's right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's quite cheesy, yeah. to be fair. Um, and so he he endures the rest of the film and we think, okay... We'll get to that point and he's going to go and do that. But to get to that point, like we say, he has to battle against the waves and the rocks and even has to come back out into the sea. Yeah, That nightmare. was like, oh, absolutely gutting. It's like, yes, yeah. he's made it. <laughs> yeah. And then he looks up and the cliff's just a sheer rock face. It's like, crap. Yeah, not um, what you want. So he makes it back out, goes back out into the sea, dashed back against the shore again. He climbs up and he's, yeah, there's the volcanic... Uh, the lava field uh, that cuts up his feet. Just another oh. extra bit of hassle. <laughs> so <laughs> hassle's one way of putting it. I'd call it a bit more than a hassle. Yeah. Um, so we see him cross like two kilometers worth of that. Because even that would be so cold. Even if you hadn't been in like the freezing ocean mm-hmm. beforehand and you weren't soaking wet, just doing that walk in a vest, freezing. I did think at the very start when we see him walking to his boat, He's wearing like a t-shirt and a Harrington jacket. I was like, How, is he not cold? At that early point, I was like, is he not cold there? And then, just yeah. Just wait. Just wait, yeah. <laughs> he is going to get cold. Um, like you say, yeah, he takes off his shirt. He's in a vest. Ooh. It's so cold that the horse's trough is just frozen over. Ooh. I thought he could have used one of the horses to like ride out. I thought this too, but if they were... Icelandic horses, presumably they're wild. Potentially. And they aren't going to want a random freezing cold man to to jump on their back. Possibly not. And I guess he is a fisherman, not a farmer. Horse wrangler. Yeah. But it was nice to see a couple of horses <laughs> amidst all this like chaos. It did feel like though when he sees the town and then turns up at the door, a bit kind of too... It was like, oh, okay. So I guess he's back then. Oh, yeah, there we wasn't like much a big of him... prim- yeah. <laughs> climatic orchestral moment. It was just like, oh yeah, he's back. No, yeah, you didn't need to watch ten minutes of him like slowly walking across a lava field, and mm. I think that's absolutely fine. Like, it did feel a bit under dramatic, but um, you know, that's that's how it was. Like, he finally made it to his house, and for a second, I thought they were just going to shut the door on him. Same, because <laughs> the kids like, Dad, there's a drunk at the door. Oh God! But you know, they didn't. Thank God. So yeah, then that takes us into the final third of the film, which was the big surprise. Like mm-hmm. at that point, it's like oh, okay, it's kind of an anticlimactic. He made it amazing, but also it's a bit like yeah, done. Mm. Oh wait, what now? Um, yeah. 
And like most of this third isn't even him trying to sort out the things he said he would do. Mm. I do wonder about this last third. Do you want to tell us what it is? What happens? So basically we see him recovering in a sense physically. And then some scientists saying, you survived all these hours in the freezing water. And then he had to do this walk. You must be literally a a medical marvel. (laughs) So he has to go in and be studied. Which again was interesting, but to me felt like a weird coda. And yeah. maybe could just have been done in a five minute kind of sequence of, you know, flashing up. He was deemed a medical marvel. He went to be studied in these places. I don't think I needed to see all of that. Yeah. It's kind of like, well, if it had been a really intensive, he's going to be put through his paces. We're going to do all sorts of crazy experiments on him. We're going to just follow it and follow it and follow it and push and push and push. But because he then decides he doesn't can't be bothered to go through all this anymore, it's a bit like, oh, okay. So you've sat in a pool of water and... I guess maybe it said not the science stuff so much, but the other him going back to his normal life, I guess is a bit of a comment on, you know, when you survive... The, the, again, the thing of like, he was just an ordinary person that happened to be caught up in a quite an extraordinary scenario, mm-hmm. extraordinary scenario. And that he wasn't then like hailed as some hero. His friends all died and he just kind of went back to quite a humdrum reality. That's exactly it. How do you adjust? But also is that his life wasn't much Mm. really. So yeah, it's like going back to that kind of in without wanting to be too harsh, Mm. boring existence of living with your parents, getting up, going fishing, but also at least to begin with, like having the town sort of look at you like what happened out there. Mm. Although we didn't really get that much of a sense of them hating on him for surviving. No, there was a bit of an interrogation vibe there, wasn't there? Of ha- ha- You couldn't have sunk there. That's not possible. Mm-hmm. Are you sure you're remembering things right? And then the families, like I thought, I thought a Hatler might be a bit more like, oh, well, you're here. Why? What happened to the rest of them? Why? Why did they not escape? But actually, we didn't really explore that. There might be a bit of interrogation on, you know, how did you survive? But actually, they're they're far more interested in the science of how he survived, not of, like, whether or not he actually did anything bad out there. I did think it was quite mean and cruel to make a man who's, like, probably got post-traumatic stress about all his friends dying in the freezing ocean Mm -hmm. sit in a freezing ice bucket tank for however long he can manage it. Yeah, and he's in there for so long. Yeah. But yeah, this doctor who sort of... At first, I was like, who's this guy watching him? Is it someone he owes money to? Is this going to get, like, proper dramatic now? Like, the guy's going to come and chase him down for his money. But it's just a doctor who wants to know more about him. Played by um, an actor who's in Trapped, actually. Very, very briefly. I I haven't seen anything else. Plays Barthur in, in Trapped. But he sort of, yeah, takes him does some experiments, sends him to London. Not that we would know we were in London at that point. <laughs> um, but yeah, he's we, know, well, we basically find out he's better at surviving cold water than the special boat service and the Navy. Mm. And then he's like, can't be bothered with, uh, with any more tests. I think for me, it did lose its way a little bit when we got to that last sequence segment. And I think 
maybe yeah, five, 10, 15 minutes on it mm-hmm. would have achieved the same thing. Yeah. I also, because we do see him try and do those things eventually, he gets through all the experiments and he comes back. It's like, right, I'm going to do the stuff that I said I was going to do to the gull. You know, I'm going to go and feed the, he feeds the dog. I mean, I don't know what's going to happen with that dog. But uh, then he goes and comforts Hatler, tells her that he fell asleep. He didn't feel any pain. Talking about Pauli and tells the kids. And that's a very lovely sentimental moment. But he, I feel like Cormaco could have just given us like a really happy ending and could have gone and kissed the, kissed the girl that he Oh, loved. you Hollywood hat. <laughs> Get out. I don't know. Cause it, because it I does just kind that. of end in a... But I did want some kind of slightly more dramatic moment to end the film. Yeah, I, but I guess, yeah, being true to, to the, the original story, the real story... It was a bit of a bummer. There wasn't much to, to say other than, yeah, he survived... Then he didn't know why he survived, and then he went back to work. The end. <laughs> Which essentially is what happens. Yeah, I, I agree. It's such a it's such a great kind of survival film. And then it's sort of like what? this kind yeah. of, I guess there is a reason why, you know, the Hollywood survival films end when they do. Mm-hmm. Because return to mundanity is mundane. It really is, yeah. Like you mentioned 127 hours earlier, which <laughs> I mean, it's really, really Hollywoody at the end, especially f- even for Danny Boyle, where he like gets himself free. Spoiler for 127 hours, gets himself free, and he starts running and running, and Cigaros starts playing, oh, yeah, and it's like Cigarette. super, super like triumphant. And I think it's festival that they're playing, and it's like building and building and building, and then suddenly it's like, yes, he's free. The sun's <laughs> shining, and he's out. And we don't get that. No. We do get the Sigaross song. We get to hear Starohu over the uh, credits. But it's very much a fi- uh, yeah, kind of opposite mm. ending, isn't it? It's very much like, and he's back on the boat and he's out to sea. And I won't be back on a boat, I'm telling you that for free. Although I guess what else does he have to do? Quite. It's not got much choice, really. Uh, especially in the 70s. I don't know what else there would have been to do. You couldn't be a digital nomad back then. A digital nomad? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't even know what to say to So yeah, it really is a film of kind of two halves or three thirds, whatever you want. The survival and the aftermath. And as we say, the first chunk really does the job. The camera work, like, because it's all handheld as well. Mm. It really feels like you're in there with them, drowning, feeling the cold. It looks amazing. It's so Mm. dark. It's so blue. The eerie shots of the dead bodies mm. uh, just floating in the sea. Like, yeah. it's all so stylish and well done and dramatic. And then it's just not mm. after that, is it? I think that's a fair assessment. But, you know, it's, it's a really fascinating story. 
And I read, I did read one review that was like, it's the kind of film that would make you want to go and read up on everything that's happening in the background, mm. which is exactly what I did. And it is fascinating. And I would, yeah, I'd love to read more about kind of the history of Heime and, and all of that stuff. Mm. And I'd love to visit the Westman Islands as well. Yeah. Uh, it looks stunning. Um, and one other thing I wanted to say, actually, we, we see at one point, the very beginning, when they get caught on the first rock, we see a lighthouse in the background, which is called, I'm going to get this right, it's called Thridrangaviti Lighthouse. And Thridranga means three rock pillars. Mm. And I was like, that's ringing a bell. So it's basically, I think it's the most remote lighthouse in the world. What? Yeah. So it's kind of, it's still south of Iceland, but it's quite a long way from the Westman Islands. And it's this lighthouse built on one rock stack like just it's like perched on the top of this stack and it's it's absolutely amazing and like the story of how they built it is insane because they didn't have helicopters back when it was built Um, and i was like but that really rings a bell and the first ever isa sigurthada tier book i read is called why did you lie and one of the three sort of plot threads is set on there it's like a ghost story kind of Mm. thing set on top of there which is chilling absolutely and it's such an amazing niche location facts. niche facts that's what i'm here for <laughs> um but yeah if you get a chance you should read that book but i was just like oh that place is real blimey Ooh, it's mad spooky. but yeah that was the deep any final thoughts i think you expressed it well just then about it being a great film that maybe then petered out a bit mm-hmm. yeah Okay, well, there we go. But maybe that's just because we're conditioned by, you know, the Hollywood cinema machine and we need to broaden our horizons. But where is this? Where is the deep to be found? So I watched it on Amazon Prime. I think it's through Freebie. Freebie. So the, Freebie, whatever that the is. One that, it's basically Amazon's free channel. But in order to watch films, they shove adverts into the, yeah. the things. But if you've got an Amazon Prime subscription... It doesn't have adverts. Oh, it did for me. Did it? Yeah. Oh, I didn't have any adverts. Oh, you cheeky so-and-so. Well, uh, I don't know then. Well, basically, Amazon Prime. So, yeah. Check it out and let us know what you think. I'll see you next week, Ellie. See you then. Okay. That was The Deep from Baltasar Kormakur, a freezing start to Series 4 and a film I think we're a little bit mixed on. What did you think? Had you heard the story before? Did you know about Gully or the Eldfell volcano? And does it work as a metaphor for Iceland's response to the financial crisis? Let us know on Instagram or Twitter or drop us an email at kvikminderpod at gmail.com. Next week we return to a familiar setting and a director we've not seen since episode one. Yep, Ellie and I get to grips with Grimoire Haukenarsson's follow-up to Rams, 2019's The County, starring Andis Hrön Egilsdottir. This is currently available to stream on the Curzon channel on Amazon Prime, or to rent or buy basically anywhere. I bought it on Apple TV, but it's also on YouTube and Google Play. See you next week. Tack Thanks and goodbye. <laughs>